So uh, we're going to move on now. Um, we're actually, uh, the team, um, the host team here has decided what we're going to start with the International Monetary Fund, one of our use cases to sort of illustrate uh, uh, what we're talking about here. So Chris, do you want to take it away? All right, come on. Here we are. Okay, yay. It looks like it's loading. You can all see that hopefully. Hi everybody, Chris again. Um, so we're, we're kicking off before we dive into all of the, the great information about um, as a service project um, with a use case just to um, kind of set the stage for what we've been working on. Um, so Ron and I are actually with Michael are going to give you some background on the IMF data that we're working with and then do a demo. Um, so we are talking about a pretty common use case. Everyone has used CD-ROMs. You've probably cataloged them, Greta and Arcadia. Um, so we, we've all got these in our collections and libraries. And the International Monetary Fund is uh, one of the prominent uh, producers, gatherers of um, economic data as, and data about um, global finance and economies. Um, and so they've been producing time series data um, since the 1970s. And so um, initially this was produced in print. Then they moved um, into the era of CDs and being able to make their data available in a database format that could be queried and you could extract data. So libraries receive these as CDs. Um, and I should point out these are not unique uh, in any way, shape or form. Um, in fact, most libraries across the globe will have them, but this is primary research data. Um, why was it important um, to bring this to the EASY program um, to, to work on? Um, is because we know that over time, um, variables get revised in these data sets. The IMF moved their uh, data online, uh, fully online about four years ago, and they were not able to include all of the vintage data. So there's issues of data revision as well as lack of access to historical data. Um, so with us being able to utilize um, the easy uh, platform, we're able to basically unlock the historic data for researchers. And then usually it's faculty and graduate students um, who are needing to access this, uh, the older vintage data. Um, oftentimes they've found it cited in a, an article and they want to track back to that original data um, because they may find that when they go to the online, it's either not available or in some cases, the numbers aren't matching up. So what we're able to do here is basically um, unlock that data. Um, I should also point out that uh, the US federal government, there's something called the Federal Depository Library Program. Um, they have had a floppy disk project, um, which has moved into a CD-ROM project. Um, and so this will actually be the first um, foray into international statistics, which I think as a GovDocs librarian is pretty awesome. And I can't wait to tell the entire GovInfo community about this um, once we're able to go into production. Um, okay, so we're going to move into a live demo. I'm going to hand it over to Ron and Michael. Um, go for it. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, can folks see my screen? Yes. Yes. Super. Okay, well, what I'm going to demonstrate here is this is, um, we've actually, uh, we're working off of CD-ROMs here. So what we've already done is we've already created an ISO, um, a preservation package of that CD-ROM. We've taken the data off of it. And what I've actually done is I've um, associated that CD-ROM installer with a, um, an operating system. In this case, we're looking at Windows XP plus Adobe Acrobat Reader 9.3. Um, so I've already associated it. And what I'm actually gonna show you here now is how we're gonna install the program. Um, this is a one-time one time process of doing the install because we'll save the environment. Uh, but I just wanted to show folks what it looks like. You get to actually work in the old Windows XP uh, uh, environment. Um, we, have, um, we also have networking currently turned off on this uh, just because uh, 
on the Stanford network if we're running a networked XP instance, uh, our uh, IT security will uh, let us know that we're running an old operating system that is no longer supported, so it's not kosher. So um, we're just quickly going through the install here. And as I said, this is a one-time process. So what we're gonna do is we're installing this application and we're just gonna save it and shut it down. And just make sure it works. Okay, yay, it runs. Um, now I'm just going to show how we would save the state. We need to properly shut down the operating system um, after I've done the install. Um, and then we'd essentially would save uh, Windows XP plus the installed uh, GFS browser, um, which is the IMF data in this case. And once it is shut down, we can actually name it. Um, so I'm gonna So this is essentially just keeping track of the stack that I've actually already installed. And then I would click and save it. Um, I'm actually not gonna save it at this point. And uh, Ron, do you wanna maybe take over and actually show folks a little bit about what the GFS actually is? Sure, Michael, thanks a lot. Uh, let me... Why don't you uh, go ahead and uh, did you unshare or should I just? Uh, I've unshared. Mute? Okay. So you should be able to share now. Okay. And Okay, uh, can people see my screen? It's good. Yes. Okay, so uh, my, as you saw, Michael basically took you through the steps within the easy framework to actually create an emulated system that included the necessary uh, version of the, of the operating system and any other software or other objects that digital objects that needed to be imported and saved in that environment. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and start up uh, the environment. And so you can see here, I've clicked on the environment screen and clicked on the objects. And I'm going to select this object uh, and run it. And then we'll all get to view the beautiful uh, beginning of Windows XP, which we probably all missed. It is a uh, hazard for folks, and, and often you can't even run it anymore since it's not supported. Uh, one thing that uh, I, you'll notice is if this is an emulation. So often things tend to lag a little bit or they tend to be a little slower than you might be used to on if it was running natively on your own computer. I still haven't come across, fortunately, the blue screen of death uh, yet, but that might be an earlier version of Windows if we ever, if we run things uh, needing that. You sound like you're missing it, Ron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, it was kind of one of those, uh, moments in the past. Okay, so now we see we have the screen here. And I'm gonna to go to the GFS browser, uh, which was installed and a shortcut was uh, installed on, on the desktop. And for those who haven't seen the wondrous uh, CD-ROM based application for browsing and extracting time series data from the 
IMF's uh, government finance statistics. This is basically the, uh, the working application. So as you can see, you can see everything that you would see if you were uh, on a, a computer. And so the first thing that often you will do because you don't want, you want to de uh, define the retrieval period that you want to use uh, to actually do your search. So in this case, because this is the uh, 2012 version of the IMF CD-ROM, and I know that that particular uh, CD-ROM only has data from about 1990 to around 2011 or so. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, constrain the retrieval period to those years. The other thing that you'll see is the GFS, uh, the working uh, navigation screen here, and you can, uh, within the, the GFS uh, browser, you can actually view uh, any of the documentation they have here as a PDF file. And that's why Adobe Acrobat 9.3 had to be installed because uh, you, had to, you have to use something that can read the kinds of stuff that uh, that bundled with that software. So you can, you can go ahead and read through any of the documentation that accompanies it. Uh, Chris and I had been talking about at some point, we would also want to identify other documents and stuff that would be useful for the user. And then I'm going to go down and actually go up here to the options because the options is another thing that a user would do to kind of um, customize their search interface. So let's say Rather than getting every single country when I'm looking at time series data, let's say I want to basically just restrict my searches to Canada and the United States. So basically I would do the classic control click and set the constraints. And now you see it's restricted now when I search or browse to Canada or the United States. I also uh, like, would like my time series data to be grouped by concept and not by country. And I want, since I want to do more of a panel thing with the data, I want it to be such that there's one, each row of the data comes out as a year in the thing. And then I, I might want to see the data source also and other metadata that's here. And so I will go ahead and click the browse again. And I'm going to go ahead and show you how you would use the economic content view because what one of the advantages of that view in this data set is it actually tries to harmonize the time series data between different countries and you can actually choose more than one country when you're searching it. So I'm just going to ch uh, choose something just to show you how you extract something. I'm going to go ahead and take revenue. As you can see, the country pane only has the two countries that fit the search. And this is the listing of all the time series uh, files that uh, come up for the, the two countries. Uh, each GFS uh, time series data has a unique code for each of those, those tables or time series that are displayed. So I am going to basically uh, say, let's get revenue, control click taxes, uh, and um, let's say, corporations and individuals. Okay. And one thing I can do is I can actually check to see the av availability because not every country in the GFS time series has data for every, every variable in the time series. So you can see here that in the availability table, Canada and United States, each table is a column and it shows you with an X if it actually has data for that. So you can see for Canada, it doesn't have anything in the last two. So I think what I'll do is I will basically not select those two. So what I will do now is select those two uh, time series. I'll select the two countries I want to extract data from, from all the time series that uh, the GFS database has. And then I'm going to add it as series that I want to retrieve. And now you can see down at the bottom, these are the four time series, one for, two for Canada, two for the United States that are ready to be retrieved. So when I'm ready, then I will basically click the retrieve button. It will do a query to the, the Microsoft uh, Access database. And now you can see this is the actual data that was extracted that I can take a look at to see if it looks fine. You can see it, it 
contains a lot of the metadata that was checked uh, in the options column. So I can see which country, the units of measure, and information like that, the description of what these different time series are, and the actual numbers and the units of measure for those time series numbers. And so if I say, okay, I think I want that, I can actually go to the file in the data viewer. This is not the browser anymore, save as, and it will save it in my documents. I'll just call this uh, test. And I, let's say I'm going to save it as an Excel 97 file because I want the most modern version of Excel for this data to be saved in. And now it should be sa saved. So now I'm going to just close the data view. And I think that basically takes you through a lot of what a user would do if, if they could actually access these historic CD-ROMs uh, in the emulation environment. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this. And uh, I basically created a shortcut for my documents on the desktop. So I'm gonna open that up. And you can see that my test data is actually there. Uh, and uh, the other, th there's other files that we would probably, or shortcuts or other information documents we'd wanna put on that desktop as we really tried to make it more user friendly and usable. Um, so as Michael said, once you finish, then uh, you go to the start menu and you turn off the computer. And one thing that you'll learn is you generally, if your cursor is trapped in the emulation window, you can click the escape key and it will be released. So now Windows is logging off. And we can go ahead and just, the, emulate, the emulator has been stopped. So um, I'm going to bring up the last slide if I can get to it in our presentation. Can everybody see that? Yes. Challenges, stability in a production environment. So Chris and I kind of through our playing with this and stuff and also thinking about how we would want to eventually serve uh, the IMF uh, databases came up with some different kinds of issues or things that we found along the way. Uh, and so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and read through them. And Chris, you can go ahead and, uh, and uh, you know, weigh in at any point. The first thing was... Ron, Regina yeah. actually asked a question, which is, oh. is our first bullet point. So Regina, I'll just point out, um, you, you asked if we could extract the data. Um, and as yeah. you can see, exporting the data in the docs out of the easy environment isn't yet possible. Okay, thank Great. you. And also, if anyone else has questions, please feel free to either type in the chat or on the uh, shared document. Uh, the other thing is what Chris had referred to uh, when she kicked off our section was, uh, you know, we need to think about other kinds of documentations, whether th that we might want to include manuals, methods, related print publications. Uh, so in a sense, it's trying to curate this whole environment with the, uh, with the object that we want to share in the emulation environment. Um, as you probably saw, it wasn't as bad as usual. It, often I blame it on my very slow home uh, network speed, <laughs> but uh, I often I would get an erratic cursor or scrolling or other behavior wouldn't work. At one point when I was uh, trying to open a, a folder or something on the desktop, I could not open it. I'd have to right click it and then uh, select open from there. Otherwise I would get the, the little window, pop-up window to, to uh, set the properties for that particular document. So there's there's little idiosyncrasies that we we still need to work through and try to see you know how robust it is for the user in different environments. The slow processing speed of the emulator it's something that we've all experienced when we've run things like Fusion and stuff on our own uh, our own software because emulation is not running necessarily natively you know on the hardware. Uh, yeah, a full screen in Windows. Uh, it, I, hopefully people were able to see it, but uh, you're, you're kind of constrained within the environment. 
to the extent with which the uh, the window uh, uh, will go. So I would at one point I had opened a a, a big PDF file uh, that had larger font, and I couldn't read it all the way across because it filled up the entire screen that was available to me. Keyboard match. Uh, I noticed that, for example, on my Mac extended keyboard, my page down and page up buttons wouldn't work in the Windows environment. So you just another little, you know, little things that, to think about for all of our users. Um, are the operating system requirements the same across all, all CDs? This is something that we, you know, will continue to investigate, especially as we, you know, uh, load more years of the IMF for different products. And Chris, you want to talk about the rights issue? Sure. So the we we've been talking with the IMF folks, letting them know that we've been working on this project. And you know, one thing we have to be cognizant of across any software environments um, is our rights issues, either with the software or with the content of the software. So in our case, the data is open. Um, the IMF has uh, released all of their data, it's publicly available, so we don't have an issue with rights with the actual data itself, but there is a, an issue that we're gonna have to investigate is the IMF contracted with a third party to write that uh, UI that you saw Ron working with, and it's unclear from the IMF standpoint um, whether or not they assert any type of right over that, um, and so that's just gonna be something before we can Kind of open this broadly um, we have to make sure that we've gotten the correct permissions if needed or at least a sign off from the company that um, we can you know make this available i don't i think the risk is fairly low um, in terms of someone trying to copy that uh, user interface because <laughs> it is so antiquated but it is an issue that we will have to be mindful of yeah, and I want to just raise that Ethan uh, gave us all little little tantalizing things for the future because this is still kind of in development, but a future uh, version of the easy environment will be able to uh, do data export. So I think especially for data CD-ROMs, that's crucial because otherwise the user, what's the use? You go in there, you extract your data, and then you can't take it out to your own computer to actually do your analysis with it. So unless we provide all of the analytical tools also in the old environment, uh, it, it really, it might, it's something that might be cool to look at, but it won't really help uh, our, our 